Bildung is a central concept in the history of German education as a complex concept with a varied history. It has no direct equivalent in the English language. Uh, however, its earliest origins stem back to ancient Greece, which is ancestor to both Germany and the United States culturally. To distill Bildung down into a brief definition, it might be thought of as a model state to be achieved by learners through cultivating their own wide intellectual capacities. These wide capacities craft their minds to be capable of autonomy. This is not an individualistic or atomistic vision of autonomy. It is a socially embedded one uh, through dedicated mentorship the individual learns to become uh, an autonomous, reflective, and contributing member of society. While Bildung is often translated directly to refer to education, it can also be understood to refer to culture. And in an important sense, it refers to both of these things. In visions of Bildung, education extends beyond the educational institution and it's ultimately uh, intimately connected with becoming a cultured citizen. In other words, education is tied intimately to the way of life of the community, which is composed of knowledgeable free thinkers. Seeking Bildung is a way of life. It is given special focus within educational institutions, but it extends well beyond them. For Adorno, higher education was degraded in much the same way that the culture industry was a form of degradation. Instead of fostering Bildung, it provided a cheapened, commodified version of education that encouraged both conformity and alienation from traditional culture. Rather than learning to think critically, students gathered information like commodities. If Bildung involved a full connection of the individual to learning and culture in a process of self-development, Adorno identified what went on in the modern university as only a pseudo version of this process, or what he deemed Halbildung. Uh, students have a relationship to information, but it does not reach them in a meaningful way, and so it ceases to be internally transformative. Knowledge is granted with only instrumental use value. Adorno identifies a growing tendency for education to focus on practical preparation for employment rather than to be aimed at bettering humanity through exploring big questions. Because of the instrumental and conformist relation to knowledge that students participate in with Haobu Dong, education serves to promote the same degrading tendencies that plague the larger culture in modern society. Unthinking conformity, disconnectedness, self-interest, and fixation on the instrumental and practical. These personality traits make society specifically vulnerable to, if not primed for, fascism. In his essay, Education After Auschwitz, Adorno insists that preventing another Holocaust is paramount for education to address. And to serve this end, students need to be facilitated to develop autonomy in their thinking rather than conformity, as well as to be encouraged to be critical of their culture and social institutions rather than just amassing facts about them. As for the neoliberal assault on the liberal arts, the term liberal arts harkens back to ancient Greece, where the class of people who were not slaves were expected to learn a variety of subjects that were worthy of free men, or liberalis in Latin. Free citizens, non-slaves, <clears throat> were expected to be educated in certain ways, especially in grammar, logic, and rhetoric, but also in music, arithmetic, geometry, and astronomy to be able to be good participants in civic life. The notion that higher education can be used as a basis for priming citizens for thoughtful democratic participation undergirds the history of American liberal arts proper as well. John Dewey was a significant influence on the development of the liberal arts in 20th century America and was an outspoken believer in the importance of liberal education in a democratic society. Today, the notion that a liberal arts education helps citizens meaningfully participate in democratic life is rarely taken seriously, or at least a lot less often. The liberal arts model of higher education is under attack from two directions, I'll say. Um, first, along with the rest of the economy, the management of higher education is under the gun of finance capital. Colleges and universities are under increased pressure to cater to would-be investors, doing whatever they can to climb the competitive rankings. 
this concern becomes ubiquitous and the preoccupation with ranking maximization extends throughout university culture. Second, in the general culture, as neoliberal rationality extends throughout, the notion of personal development or enrichment as a civic virtue independent of payoff on the job market seems quaint. The situation is, of course, located within a larger culture that's undergoing continuous colonization by neoliberal rationality. The neoliberal attack on the liberal arts is one wing, um, I believe, of a wholesale assault on intellectualism. As for the populist assault on intellectualism, the transformation inside the academy is part of a larger transformation that subsumes the academy. The current anti-intellectual trend is not an isolated occurrence in American history, however. Intellectualism has remained a more or less contested value for hundreds of years. Of course, this does not mean that the severity of anti-intellectual sentiment is always the same. When populism is on the rise, the intellectual is frequently a scapegoat or at least a target of animosity. The logic behind this is somewhat unavoidable. Intellectualism unavoidably contains an elitist element. This happens on at least three fronts. First, the intellectual is in a position of ostensible personal superiority over those who are less educated. Second, higher education tends to be a ladder toward higher earning capacity. And third, higher education leads to careers that involve greater power in society. So to some degree, the accusation that intellectualism and its associated educational institutions are bastions of elitism is impossible to refute. But when the people, in quotes, start to mobilize against the elites, and this is a condensed definition of a populist movement, um, the intelligentsia is bound to come under moral fire. In addition, the rejection of the intellect tears away the accountability of political leaders to appeal to reason, as well as of the people to check their convictions against evidence and analysis. This provides a foothold for extremist demagogues to be taken more seriously, as well as susceptibility among the people to follow charismatic leaders. As for uh, liber liberal democracy and authoritarian populism, um, in Dialectic of Enlightenment, Horkheimer and Adorno famously lay out their thesis that liberal democratic societies are prone to turning to fascism. The mechanisms by which this takes place are multiple, but for the sake of brevity and comprehensibility, I'll explain three general paths in a very general way. First, there's the fact that tools and strategies originally used for liberation can come to be forces of oppression. In the case of the Enlightenment, science and reason were liberating forces from domination by tradition and the church, yet over time society became increasingly constrained by the hegemony of scientific and instrumental rationality. To illustrate this dynamic, Horkheimer and Adorno refer to a scene from the works of the ancient Greek writer Homer. In the scene, the protagonist Odysseus leads a, crip of sh uh, a ship of crewmen through an encounter with the sirens, which are irresistible and lethal female figures whose beautiful singing voices seduce men, overtaking them and resulting in their deaths. Odysseus' solution to the overwhelming power of the sirens is to have his crewmen tie him to the mast of their ship. So he escapes from the external powers and preserves his autonomy in the face of them by way of volunteering up his autonomy. He preserves his power by giving it up. In much the same way, Enlightenment rationality has acted as a liberating force as Euro-America exited the Middle Ages. Yet the medium of this liberation is one that has committed the West to a cultural impoverishment that banishes all but the most instrumental aspects of life. No longer dominated by the church of God, we are now dominated by a kind of church of scientific reason. Hence our historical move toward greater freedom is simultaneously a move toward greater oppression. Second, the destruction of scientific, uh, of substantive values, sorry, and critical capacities paves the way for authoritarianism in another way as well, preemptively neutralizing resistance. People become apathetic and lose their capacity for empathy. They decouple from moral sensibilities other than the imperative to observe reality as it is and follow rational procedures. Without connection to other people, without organic commitment to community, people are primed to accept domination and genocide as it happens. There's no basis from which to have a sense of moral revulsion against it. It's in this second sense that Adorno later declared the need for education to encourage critical consciousness so as to prevent another Auschwitz. 
The sense that educational institutions are under threat by dehumanizing forces is not a novel one. People have been noting tendencies in this direction for generations. Certain historical conditions may be new, such as neoliberalism in particular, but this does not mean the damage they cast is unheard of. This should be concerning as well as comforting. On the one hand, it indicates that these problems are long-standing and possibly endemic to modern institutions of education, as Adorno attested to. Uh, the repeated outcries indicate that the problems have never been solved. On the other hand, the repeated outcries against the degradation of liberal education attest that education still maintains value elements that have not been destroyed and are still discernible enough to mobilize some people to speak in favor of their protection. Evidently, the ideal of a broader education for autonomy and civic participation, whether in the form of the American liberal arts ideal or the German ideal of Bildung, is a more robust notion than Adorno ascertained. Also, thinkers of the past still have something to say about our present day predicament. On a more alarming note, Horkheimer and Adorno developed the ideas outlined above in the process of insightfully theorizing the roots of fascism in Germany and in general, to the extent that American culture today bears many similar burdens to the Weimar culture of the 1920s. There's all the more reason to protect the university's capacity to function foremost as a public sphere rather than simply a training ground for higher earning capacity. As for the third general path, Social disconnection, lack of substantive values, and a thoroughly commodified culture leave people empty and longing for a more vibrant relation to life and to one another, even if only subconsciously or semi-consciously. They also have much anger and resentment from living in a culture which does not feed their whole person. Society becomes increasingly unstable, and the sense of looming danger and disaster grows. When a charismatic authoritarian leader comes along promising protection and belonging, it can be very compelling to a fearful, alienated, and demoralized population. All right. Well, first, uh, thanks, Jeremiah, for getting this organized um, and for setting up the, you know, the network as well to have these presentations. I thoroughly enjoyed yours, and I think it's the kind of thing we need to talk about more. Um, so what I'm talking about today is pending peer review. A book chapter that's uh, planning on coming out in <clears throat> IGI Glo uh, Global's Current Challenges and Trends in Political Propaganda, Advertising, and Public Relations. And this uh, chapter is entitled Bernays, Horkheimer, and Adorno Theory in the Age of Social Media. Uh, I'm just going to read the abstract and the intro, uh, and I'll skip over the parts that have to do with maybe specifically uh, social theory itself. You all know this text probably better than I do. Um, but just to begin, here's the uh, abstract introduction. Uh, so social media and the 21st century mass communication have changed the technological landscape of marketing and advertising, enabling instant content creation, content curation, and audience feedback. The thought of Edward Bernays can be useful in examining and interrogating today's media, especially through the lens of Frankfurt School social theorists Mac Horke Max Horkheimer and Theodore Adorno. Further, the works Crystallizing Public Opinion and Propaganda will be critiqued through ideas found in Dialectic of Enlightenment to uh, give business and PR professionals ethical concepts that may be applied to modern trends in communications and PR. So within the age of social media, propaganda techniques are ubiquitous. Whether they appear as user-generated content displayed as the results of invisible, yet personally tailored, algorithms, or by means of dialogue and discourse, which actively demean outgroups or DFI in groups. The results of propaganda are often observed post hoc, that is, after website uh, traffic data is collected or after violent protests take place. Naturally, qualitative data only functions to observe after the fact documentation. Other tools may be needed to attempt to understand the effects of propaganda before damage is done. Social theory, seen as distinct from fields such as community management or data science, which may be trendy in the digital age, is a useful and interrogative lens which provides an explanatory framework through which the results, justifications, and development of modern propaganda may be explored. Such exploration clarifies the why of certain results of propaganda, but may also outline the particular styles of communication and group behaviors which may predict philosophically rather than empirically, future actions as a result of propaganda. 
Propaganda theory will be explored through the work of a practitioner and through the lens of theorists. Bernays, by means of crystallizing public opinion and propaganda, serves as an interlocutor for practice. His writing will be examined theoretically and his conclusions applied to modern digital and social media methods of communication. From the theorist perspective, the work of Horkheimer and Adorno, primarily through Dialectic of Enlightenment, clarifies the role of theory in making sense of the ethical quandaries and potentially unsafe outcomes from a culture of propaganda. I'll just introduce uh, Edward Bernays really quickly. Uh, known as the father of PR, Edward Louis Bernays, who lived from 1891 through 1995, developed the budding field of mass communications into the modern practices of advertising and marketing. His expertise as a public relations counsel led to his involvement in commun uh, communications projects involving matters from United States presidencies, overseas military coups, breakfast foods, hairnets, cigarettes, and more. Harnessing the power of another growing field, the psychological studies, he apparently appreciated the animalistic and evolutionary understanding of human nature developed by his uncle, Sigmund Freud, quoting him favorably in Propaganda. Uh, about his two books. Crystallizing Public Opinion was written in 1923. His first book on the subject, written in the style of a public relations counselor, giving advice to another PR counsel. In this work, the somewhat new and burgeoning field is spoken of descriptively with fairly non-directive advice centered around advertising case studies. Propaganda, written a few years later in 1928, sought to identify the rules of propaganda a much more prescriptive manuscript, detailing something of a manifesto of what works within PR. In each of these books, Bernays' focus is not on economics or finance. There are no mathematical formulas to follow. Each might share space on a bookshelf next to Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People, um, as each of Bernays' works are filled with anecdotes and stories, most of which are somewhat anonymized renditions of his own successes in PR and advertising. His fruitful marketing campaigns are described throughout each book to illustrate the efficacy of his techniques, and a historical lens is often needed to connect his narratives to his real-life clients. Um, the next section just kind of goes over some of the foundations and history of the Frankfurt School and who Horkheimer and Adorno are. Um, and just as I'm flipping through the pages here, I think it is interesting to note that this is the book that this is going in is, is a book really by marketers and advertisers for marketers and advertisers. So to me, it's fairly exciting that um, a chapter on social theory is uh, being considered for it. I kind of wish I had uh, understood a little bit more about social theory when I started my work in advertising. Uh, but now let's talk about the current landscape of uh, propaganda and media. To quote Bernays, one could at no very great expense and with no very great difficulty in the early 18th century cover New England with political messaging, local announcements, and other information. With the global reach capabilities of advertising platforms through search engines and social media, almost anyone now has the same ability with a relatively small budget as well. Though Bernays did not live in today's world of instant messaging and live streaming, his thought can be applied to various topics and current trends of marketing and advertising. So let's talk about his uh, analysis of the market as it might be considered today. Regarding today's market, it may be the case that an ethical good is achieved by organizations and movements which care, or at least give the perception of care, for their employees or other social goods. This could include advertising a company's role in social activism or communicating that employees are paid a living wage and receive benefits like college tuition reimbursement, or that a certain percentage of funds for certain enterprises are donated to charity. Bernays' insight here for the PR Council is that these initiatives should be handpicked to increase social capital and communicated in ways that will increase the organization's appeal to the wider public. PR must, quote, consider other things than merely the product and trying to build up a favorable public reaction. Bernays also believes in a supra-rational reasoning behind those who are influenced by the market. Consumers do, quote, not think in the strict sense of the word. In place of thoughts, they have impulses, habits, and emotions, driven and illuminate and influenced by those around them. With this perspective, one can make sense of certain crowd dynamics on the internet, from a Kickstarter campaign meeting, a meeting a deadline through the help of a celebrity's social proof, 
or in the mob-like piling on, which can take, uh, take place resulting in real life consequences, such as someone losing employment for old pictures or posts that were made public and shared widely. Let's talk a little bit about the term, his term propaganda. Bernays did not necessarily believe that the word propaganda was perhaps the most neutral term. Bernays thought that the word itself, in of itself, was harmless and, to use his word, wholesome even, but it developed something like a negative connotation. Using a religious analog, propaganda was akin to proselytization, whereas public relations was more like outreach. In crystallizing public opinion, Bernays understood public relations as a concept, profession, and field to be very new and unfamiliar to both buyers and sellers, and so made use of a more neutral descriptor, PR. At the same time, he understood both PR and propaganda to be similar concepts. Um, he does argue that this was not always the case. In fact, he references Propagandum Fidei, written by the Pope in 1622, to be an example of a more innocent version of the word, meaning something more like propagation rather than something like sinister falsehood. A basic definition of propaganda, according to Bernays, would be the following, quote, the conscious, conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses. Of course, such a term has inherent negative implications and is for some a bridge too far. Bernays seems to leave these distinctions to individual marketers themselves. Though non-advertising practitioners, for instance, social theorists, may understand there to be a range of moral or ethical dilemmas, um, it should be noted that Bernays's descriptive understanding of propaganda is such that it Im implies an implicit distrust for industry, but that one is not necessarily required to react against systems which one may find personally distasteful. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the attention economy, as it's often called today. In the time of Marx and Engels, of course, the concerns uh, in 1844 had to do more with the electric telegraph. Um, Adorno, interestingly, in Education After Auschwitz, and speaking about the newly developed television, he stated that, quote, the universal dissemination of these means of communication would be able to mitigate the worst barbarism of rural life through appropriate broadcasts. Though TV programming can, of course, be turned into propaganda, Adorno would likely not have suspected the unregulated reach and ubiquity of democratized, quote, TV stations that we now call YouTube channels or Twitch streams, suggested to users by algorithms, which have the potential to turn consumerism into radicalism. In Propaganda, Bernays states, quote, that the steam engine, the multiple press, and the public school, and of course in our time social media, have taken the power away from kings and given it to the people. So this concept again of freedom and this libertine impulse. But this has happened very quickly and to the benefit to the benefit of small and brands alike, but the complexities of violent and virulent messaging have not been especially commented on by Bernays. He likely would have assumed that the various barriers to entry from the FCC to expensive television and studio equipment would have kept vicious tendencies at bay, but the world of modern virtual messaging bears no such stop gaps. Further, populism-driven politics and oppressive dialogue with their quote-unquote totalitarian sloganeering have found effective sounding boards in modern media. Bernays is careful to maintain that history and those recording history are what make the truth. He records an exchange between a few individuals talking about um, world, ch world changing people being overlooked. Um, and his, you know, of course, blames this on them having bad PR. So he takes the example of lanterns being held, hung in the old North church to warn that the British are coming and makes the case that um, after one interlocutor asks, does anyone else remember the names of the other writers to warn about the British are coming? The conclusion is obvious per Bernays' analysis. He says, did Revere make history or did Longfellow, quoting the poet. So the attention economy were to Bern Bernays to analyze it today should not, um, should not be understood to follow some sort of self-regulating -regula evolutionary process which allows for the best stories to automatically rise to cultural consciousness. These messaging need a storyteller, like the writer Longfellow, to craft a compelling narrative, perhaps with some poetic license here and there, which may become the consumer's closed canon. Bernays, unfortunately, cannot give insight uh, into who has the power of a 21st century Longfellow, since the landscape is incredibly diverse and much more fast paced. I'm gonna skip a little section on uh, the influencer economy and the role of influence today, um, just for the sake of time. Um, 
But really quickly, let's talk about the mythos of propaganda. Um, connections between mythology from dialectic uh, can be drawn between today's modern day business concepts, particularly through the understanding of culture and cultists and th things like that. So myth as it concerns Horkheimer and Adorno has to do with the value of an object or artifact um, in relation to maybe uh, today's understanding of propaganda as an artifact that might be commodified or reified. Um, uh, particularly borrowing from Benjamin's uh, idea of aura or presence in today's uh, today's world, relationships, uh, closeness, connections, and influence, of course, can all be flattened just as his illustration of the mountain range can be flattened. So in, in today's world with the influencer economy and the mythos of what it, what it means to be connected with people and connected to influencers has really also become flattened as well. And so there's sort of a, a cheap mechanically separated version of relationships and connections that exists today. This, of course, can be applied to the understanding of culture industry from dialectic. Um, but I also just want to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about, yeah, let's, let's talk about this. Um, essentially, the point is this. Since the highest goods of modernity, as we experience it in advertising, are lower price points and higher utility value, social theorists claim that the individual unique cultures of countries around the globe can are unfortunately watered down, so the mythos goes away or leveled out in the name of efficiency. It, it is in this way that the culture industry averages out the mythology of various cultural artifacts. A few examples can be given here. In the early 2000s, tribal prints and designs were popular in fashion, borrowing design elements from Native American textiles and decor. However, what was in vogue was not the sacred elements from those things, but the look of a tribal print. Those things were reified and made available for purchase in shopping malls and department stores. So rather than being in the know about a, sp a specific culture, what became important is knowing about how this particular kind of culture gets commodified and how and when it comes in and out of style. I spend a little bit more time in the chapter just describing a little bit more about modernity, about the current kind of uh, libertine trends that are found within advertising. And I'll just conclude by reading the last little bit of the conclusion. So it's understandable that marketers and advertisers may not have an academic need to take all the ethics courses that philosophy majors might be required to study. However, at the same time, those in business, communications, or advertising may remember the old philosophical adage, the unexamined life is not worth living, and explore a point of view, namely through Horkheimer and Adorno, which offers to rehumanize systems and services. And therefore, social theory through Bernays and Horkheimer can be uh, made available and hopefully useful to advertisers. As a whole critical theory, one of the central motives of Adorno's work was the investigation of the tendencies and counter tendencies of capitalist development. In other words, to what extent the tendencies of capital accumulation are concretely confirmed and what are the elements which oppose their imposition. This is how Adorno described the possibility of a dialectical theory in his sociological lectures. According to him, the concept of tendency refers to the regularities which develop in society. Society itself would be unintelligible without this concept, since it, it mediates what is socially given and the concept of society. He illustrates the question, starting that, that capital concentration is a capitalist tendency already set in its liberal epoch, though it does not mean its immediate accomplishment. So I quote from the recently published philosophical element of a theory of a society. The tendency towards concentration that is endogenous to liberalism will cause it difficulties in the foreseeable future. People speak today of social market economy, for example, which really means an, an infinite restriction of liberalism, end of quote. In short, Adorno refers to the inclusion in theory of, of what is non-identical in its concept, that is, the possibility of dialectical theory. However, the observation of tendencies and counter-tendencies in late capitalism between the end of the Second World War and the beginning of the 70s is not only one of the central themes of critical theory. Moreover, it points to its, to its potential renewal without excluding the possibility of a radical transformation of society. If essential characteristics of capitalism remain despite or because of its changes, central issues of critical theory are still important, although we must recognize that things have changed since the death of Adorno. As we all know, Adorno died in 1969 after several protests and revolts in the heart of Western administered societies. Therefore, he did not envisage the directions of the changes that just had begun 
and which modify substantially the way capitalism works. On the one hand, this represents an imminent difficulty concerning political theory. Would it be possible to anticipate the tendencies of capitalist development, the crisis in its mode of regulation from the end of the 60s and its new constitution in the next decade? If critical theory admitted the persistence of contradictions in bourgeois societies, why it did not address the possibilities opened by that contradictions, at least in the post-war period? How can we understand the historical period that, period that follows after the 70s regarding the theoretical tools provided by critical theory? Are they adequate to understand what happened with the consolidation of neoliberalism? On the other hand, the fact that critical theory had an exam of central tendencies of late capitalism as one of its main concerns suggests that the ident identification of some decisive issues that would be exacerbated after the 70s. The attempt to revitalize critical theory must consider the temporal core of its concepts and diagnosis. At the same time, bourgeois social relations have expanded dynamically. It was no longer possible to think of an affluent society regarding the deterioration of workers' living conditions and the consolidation of financialization and dispossession, although these processes occurred through an unprecedented expansion of the commodity form, fetishism and cultural industry. The evolution of capitalist social relations after Adorno's death represented a significant dissolution in the social agreement of the Fordist regulation, which characterized an attempt to solve the profitability crisis at the end of the 60s and was not fully acknowledged in his theory. We can absolutely take the processes of commodification and financialization as a reinforcement of historical tendencies that began previously. But at the same time, critical theories insistent on the contradictory character of bourgeois society poses questions to which Adorno turned back frequently. If contradiction and social antagonism are inherent to capitalism, why they are obscured and mitigated. One possible way to access the contradictions and possibilities of critical theory can consist of the examination of social conflicts and its expressions in the post-war period. In particular, the problem of the so-called integration of the proletariat must be carefully addressed. This question was already discussed in the 30s when the Institute for Social Research in Frankfurt observed the support of the German workers to the rise and consolidation of Nazism. After the Second World War, critical theory continued to examine the question with new aspects. Given the material and technical development of capitalism, as well as the improvement of living conditions of strata of the working classes, the apparent absence of class consciousness called the attention of Adorno and also Marcuse. Although the destructive tendencies of capitalist society persisted, workers of the affluent world did not become a revolutionary class. Despite the importance of the integration of the proletariat, critical theory did not analyze it as a phenomenon without contradictions. On the one hand, integration is not a superficial characteristic of late capitalism, but a structural feature. On the other hand, it veiled, dis it veiled disintegrative tendencies that were part of society's reproduction and expansion. At first sight, Adorno emphasized what I call a dialectics of class conflicts suspension mainly because he described class relations in late capitalism with a topographic image. He contended that the Marxian concept of proletariat corresponded to an extraterritoriality, and I quote, that is, the fact that, on the one hand, the proletariat not only reproduces the life of society as a whole through the sale of the commodity of labor power, but also gains a share in the society by receiving a minimum. At the same time, it is defined as something essentially located outside of society, as its more or less defenseless, defenseless object or victim." End of quote. In contrast to the workers in situation 19th century, their integration corresponded to the fact that they were able to reproduce their lives beyond that minimum. That is, their difference regarding upper classes was materially reduced. This change has significant consequences for class negativity. Once the workers are integrated, they set their rebel potency aside. Seen in those terms, the problem of integration is understood as the internalization of something external to capitalist society. It helps to explain the image of critical theory as intimately associated with the abandonment, abandonment of the revolutionary hopes. The working classes are considered in that, in that external position. Then the abdication of radical changes would be almost a logical result of integration. However, 
It is possible to consider the question differently, as long as we dislocate the extraterritorial image in favor of an examination of the internal contradictions of capitalist society. Then, we could understand the integration of the proletariat as the expansion of the inner logic of capital relations. There is an important element regarding integration that avoid Adorno's special, avoids Adorno's special argument. His insistence on the topic on several occasions suggested that it was not a closed concept. It is plausible to think that his ideas about the problem could become more precise during the examination of social conflicts. It is also reasonable to suppose that his insistence on the integration of the proletariat concerns its political significance. Hence, it's not a question of abandoning the struggles of workers and other dominated groups, which consists of a typical representation of critical theory. On the contrary, Adorno's disquiet could be expressed as the following. If the, contradiction, sorry, if the conditions of capitalist development imply a growing difficulty regarding political organization and the perception of social conflict, at least at the center of capitalism, then the possibility of a radical change requires new forms of political struggle since traditional forms of organization were part of the integration. Think, for, exa for example, on how critical theory observed the, ways, the way workers and left-wing parties were attached to exploitation and domination mechanisms within state institutions. The obstacles imposed by the matter involve a term related to integration, conformism, conformism in, in German. In capitalist societies, the majority of individuals lose or has no conditions at all to produce and reproduce their lives autonomously, which means they have to sell their labor power. It also means that the reproduction of their daily lives will be following commodity form and a submission to capital accumulation imperatives. And I'm here talking, taking some of uh, Marcuse's ideas in his Paris lectures as a starting point. The capitalist tendencies described by Marx, the rising organic composition of capital and the falling rate of profit, should be examined alongside changes in capitalism. Together with the monopolization of capital, there is the expansion of the process of conversion of labor power into commodity, which means that more and more people are separated from the means necessary to the reproduction of their daily lives. The basis for exploitation is enlarged and corresponds to the growing importance of the service sector, that is, exploitation goes far beyond factories and even stores. And it is no accident that Adorno referred to this problem in his conference about late capitalism and industrial society. He contended that as long as capitalism could be, could be identified with an industrial society, it represented the fact that industrial labor became the model for this society. At the same time, the expansion of the labor force through a growing service sector implied a division among workers. This demarcation appears to be more evident to workers than their antagonistic relationship regarding capitalists. Also, it consists of a particular moment of the containment of class struggles. Uh, in particular, Adorno insisted several times that the concept of class should not be determined by the consciousness of a worker as about his or her, of his or her existence and relationships. A rigorous class analysis must consider the objective moment of the constitution of social classes, namely, the tendencies of the bourgeois society themselves create a division among individuals, the possession or not of the means of production. For this reason, integration is not only a subjective phenomenon, despite its apprehension occurs through the direct, direct individual experience. According to Marcuse, Neither integration nor conformism concern a difference between class consciousness and their objective conditions. Furthermore, in his introductory lectures in sociology, Adorno contends that the essential regarding of an analysis of society consists of the way social relationships impose as laws which affect the destiny of the individuals. At the same time, these laws include the possibility that society stops, I quote, being the coercive union in which we find ourselves, end of quote. We, he illustrates the issue with the relevance of thinking on classes at the end of the 60s, mainly because the tendency of class consciousness has to, to decrease was in question. On the one hand, integration consists of an appearance since the possession of the means of production is still the decisive, decisive criteria for the reproduction of individuals' lives. Then, it is not so important if a worker considers himself a proletarian or not. On the other hand, the fact that he does not see himself as a worker 
express an important sociological question. I quote, one, thought, one ought to try to explain the non-appearance of class consciousness or the disappearance of the proletariat in terms of the obje objective laws of society from its essential regularity, end of quote. In other words, the historical situation in which the working classes of the affluent societies found themselves should be understood in terms of the laws of motion in capitalist societies. Adorno's intent was double. First, he wanted to show that one of the tasks of sociology consists of identifying social, essential social relations, such as class, which decisively attach individuals to anonymous and not transparent processes. Conversely, sociology must also understand how those tendencies introduce some changes that lead to a situation where the same relations do not appear in their traditional sense. Nonetheless, antagonism and contradiction remain fundamental characteristics, characteristics of bourgeois society. People realize the context of delusion despite their integration and conformism. That's why I don't address the little fractures left behind by social conflicts, like the discomfort from workers with the pace of the production in factory. And Adorno was here referring to the research called Betriebsklima, uh, carried by the Institute in the 50s. They could not name their dissatisfaction, nor target it against their superiors. At most, they collided with their immediate superiors. Even if society's rationality is perceived, this perception is still diffuse, apolitical, and disorganized for the majority. Given this idea, it remains a question. Why critical theory did not intensify the examination of the counter tendencies to integration? If capitalist society bears the possibility of a radical change, why some of its contradictions and antagonisms were not thoroughly analyzed? Sorry. I'm thinking in particular in a concept of crisis and its lack in Adorno's writings. Adorno, Horkheimer, and Marcuse saw the historical development of capitalism in the Western as a form of administered society. In other words, the economic and political regulation that characterized the welfare societies was intimately associated with the stabilization of capital accumulation and the relative steadiness of its pace. State intervention was one of its cornerstones, so that it was plausible, at least for a donor, that this development could put into question the validity of the law of value. It is even, it is even more astonishing that someone like Adorno, who emphasized time and again, a dialectical method did not consider the possibility of a political and economic crisis. Despite the lack of this discussion in Adorno's essays, one can remember here Horkheimer's analysis in the mid-30s, in particular in the studies on authority and family. When he examined the relationships between economic, political, and cultural crises, Horkheimer showed that they had effects on personal life. As far as it, as far as it is disarranged, there is a crisis in the individual sense of orientation and the weakening of her or his psychic domain, which resulted in the need of external direction. It gives a feeling of control and safety. Therefore, the situation opened the possibility for an authoritarian solution as well as an emancipatory one. And I'm, and I'm finishing here. I believe this concept of crisis constitutes the missing link between Adorno's observations on capitalist tendencies and counter tendencies and the possibility of renewing the prospects for a contemporary critical theory. In particular, it can be useful to understand why far right and authoritarian movements obtain social and political support, even among workers and other dominated groups, in a moment when emancipatory politics do not appear as the horizon of change. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>